Welcome to the Living Your Greatness podcast. I am your host, Ben Mummy. The purpose of the podcast is to inspire millions of people across the world to achieve greatness and enhance their overall personal well-being. Living Your Greatness is becoming the go-to resource that CEOs, elite athletes, professional coaches, and entrepreneurs rely on to upgrade themselves. The podcast helps you master the best of what other people have already figured out. So I gladly invite you to sit back, relax, and enjoy tuning in to today's episode. Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of Living Your Greatness. This is your host, Ben Mummy, and today we have a new guest to the show, and his name is Carl Moore. So for those of you that don't know Carl, he is an award-winning teacher, researcher, and internationally recognized leader in the study of introvert, amivert, and extroverted leaders. Carl has interviewed over a 1,000 CEOs. Carl hosts a weekly program called the CEO Series on Montreal radio station CJAD, where he conducts one-on-one interviews with global thought and business leaders. Carl has blogged weekly for Forbes for over 10 years and has a weekly piece in French in Quebec business publication called Les Affaires. Carl was nominated for the Thinkers 50 Distinguished Achievement Awards in the leadership category as a top thinker for his work on introverts, extroverts, and the C-suite and millennials. So Carl, it is a pleasure to have you on the show today. Welcome. Thanks, Ben. It's great to be here with you and um, share some time. Yeah, no, I'm super stoked to have you on today. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Like, where did you spend your formative years growing up? And what inspired you to become an award-winning teacher, researcher, and a world-class leader in the study of introvert, ambivert, and extroverted leaders? Well, Ben, I'm from Toronto. Grew up there in Scarborough, which is a kind of a poor area. Our dad had great for education, was a janitor. So grew up in a, uh, you know, lower middle class family at best. Um, then followed my brother to Los Angeles for university. So kind of opened up. I remember um, the first flight. I'd never been on a plane before. This is a long time ago, Ben, because my mom went on the plane with me and put on my seatbelt to make sure I was tucked in. And the, the flight attendant said, oh, that's all right. This is so pre-9-11 a story. So I went to school in L.A., um, a small college. I went to USC, University of Southern Cal for my MBA, did postgraduate work at Harvard, and then worked for IBM Natashi for 11 years in Toronto, Hamilton, and Regina. At a certain point, it was all action. I knew what I was doing, but there wasn't a lot of thought. So I looked for more thought. So I did a PhD, it was all thought, no action. So I went the other extreme. But eventually, as I became a faculty member at Oxford, there was more you know, engagement in teaching, executive teaching, research, and so on. And in my PhD, I looked at how do Canadian subsidiaries of U.S. multinationals earn global responsibilities, and so I did a bunch of CEO interviews. And having worked at IBM, as I was used to the the CEO cells, they call it, so it felt comfortable. And I was a little bit older than the average doctoral student. I was early 30s. And at Oxford, I did a lot of exec teaching, so I got to know other CEOs and senior executives and just felt comfortable. And I moved to McGill about 22 years ago to work with a guy named Henry Mintzberg, one of the great thinkers in the world. My wife's from Quebec City, and my mom was in Toronto, her mom in Quebec. So Montreal's halfway, Dartmouth and MIT recruited me, but I wanted to work with one of the greats in the world. And McGill does have a great reputation around the world as well. So I ended up here. And um, on the first week, we had a new dean. My first week, we had a, and I said to him, I said, Jerry, We have these great programs in India and China and Japan, but the people who give us money are in Montreal and Toronto, to a large degree. I said, Jerry, you should have lunch with the top 10 CEOs in Montreal. And he said, Carl, why don't you set it up? And I didn't realize as a professor, I don't have to do anything I don't want to, to a large degree. But I I, I knew one CEO, Robert Milton, ran Air Canada, because my four-year-old son, Eric, played t-ball with his four-year-old daughter. So I knew him as a dad. And we had a great lunch. On the way back, with him and Kaylin Rabinesco, who became the next CEO of Air Canada, an hour and a half great lunch. And on the way back, I said, Jerry, we didn't ask for anything. I'd been in sales at IBM. And in a sales call, you have an objective at the end. Move the ball forward a bit. And so I came up with the CEO speaker series to get CEOs to McGill. And that led to a CEO class. And one of the guys taking my class had 26 radio stations working for him across Quebec. And so in January of the next year, his number two 
Chris phoned me up and said, can I buy you an expensive lunch? I said, sure. Expensive lunch, I'm there. And he said, Martin thinks your class should become a radio show. And so it's now a national radio show heard across Canada. And it, it opens doors. Because I'm taking students to uh, Ghana and the Ivory Coast. We may meet with the president of Ghana and or the Ivory Coast, partly because we can say we're going to record a radio show for a G7 country. And therefore, it's more important to them. Because it's a value to them. So it's not just seeing the students and I, but it's something they get something out of it. So that's kind of the where I got to today. Lived in the States for six years, England for five. Lived in Toronto, Regina, Hamilton, now Montreal for many years. And was a, a business person and now more of a thought, hopefully. Well, I'm in the world of thought. Occasionally uh, a thought leader, but certainly live in the world of thought. But still do uh, speeches and things where there's some action. So a combination of those things appeals to me. Carl, I love like your curiosity and I love to the gift that you have done to share your curiosity, you know, by bringing on not only these incredible CEOs and unpacking, you know, their insights, but sharing that with your students, right? And fostering continuous learning. I really enjoyed, and I'm sure my guests as well enjoyed hearing more about your background, you know, where you grew up, your story of where those passions kind of developed. And something that I want to move to, Carl, is before we dive a little deeper in today's chat, I think it's really important that my listeners have a better understanding of like the difference between an introvert, an amivert, and an extrovert leader. So how would you define each of these leadership personality types? And is there one common myth that you would like to debunk? Well, something where the central uh, construct from the psychological literature is your response to stimulation. So it's not about being shy or liking people or not. It's about, do you respond well and like stimulation? And they did a study many years ago at Harvard where they took four-month-old babies, stimulated them, and they would see their response. And then they followed them for decades, and it was a reasonably strong predictor, not perfect, but a reasonably strong predictor if you'd be more introverted or extroverted. So an introvert is someone who loves people, loves to be with them, but if they have too much stimulation, they tilt over. They've had enough, and they take introvert breaks where they recharge. And so they might walk a dog, they might put headphones on, listen to music, or they might read a book by themselves. What you might do is at a party, go sit in the bathroom by yourself. Now, I tell people don't do that because there's people that need to use the bathroom. So grab your phone, go out into the backyard and go, "Uh uh-huh, uh-huh, into your phone and people will leave you alone. Now, extroverts, extroverts, and I'm an extreme extrovert. Now, it's a bell curve, Ben, where some people are very extroverted like myself. Some people are very introverted, but most people are a little bit introverted or extroverted. And I seek stimulation. So if I'm sitting here in my office where I'm talking to you from for a couple hours, ironically writing a book about introverts, at a certain point, I can't take it anymore. I don't know if you hear the pain in my voice, but I can't take it anymore. So I go down one floor where there's a... The undergraduate student lounge and there's an endless supply of people that I'm teaching admittedly giving grades to but they you know they come down and I chat with them and they enjoy it and a number of them as they've heard me talk about it will go extrovert break so as an extrovert now I read um, about introvert breaks there's a lot of literature but no one had written about extrovert breaks and I said but I take them so I wrote a piece for the Wharton Leadership Digest about the five types of extrovert breaks so an extrovert after being alone for a while, seeks out stimulation. So when I go traveling without my wife and kids, I'll go eat at the bar, take a book, in case it's really a dull conversation, but I'll go, I won't sit by myself at a table, I will go, Ben, and talk to total strangers at a bar, and I go up to them and say, hi, I'm Carl from Montreal, so Americans relax if you're, you know, in the States. Um, Sadly, my wife and kids can't be here, so I thought I'd talk to some native New Yorkers. So everybody relaxes, and you know, um, enjoys chatting. So I take extrovert breaks to recharge my batteries. Now, so it's the response to stimulation. Now, ambiverts is kind of a newish, well, it's a word that came from the 1920s. A psychologist in the U.S. invented it. And it almost entirely disappeared from the literature until Adam Grant, who's a rock star prof at Wharton, did a study about 12 years ago now looking at salespeople. And He hasn't written anything about it since, but I took up the idea because traditionally we viewed all leaders as extroverts. This is the old school view, and it is a passe. 
So I read a book, uh, Quiet, by Susan Cain. I've done some work with, Quiet, uh, with Susan, taught with her, and uh, done some writing. What we recognize is that many leaders are extroverts, but many are introverts. But a central insight I've had from over 450 interviews with C-suite executives around it is that, and this is the title of the book I'm, I'm writing for Stanford, is we're all ambiverts now. That at to- an ambivert is someone who acts like an introvert at times and an extrovert at other times. What I'm arguing that as an executive, you need to act like an ambivert. Sometimes you act introverted, sometimes extroverted, but you've got to remain true to yourself. That I'm an extrovert and I can act like an introvert, but it's exhausting and I take extrovert breaks to recharge. So let me give an example of an introvert who, takes, uh, who acts like an extrovert is uh, Claude Mangeau. So Claude was the COO of CN, about 24,000 people, big train company here in Montreal. And in fact, he was the first executive I asked if he was an introvert or extrovert. I never had asked anyone before, but I had read Susan Cain's book. And I had reviewed it for my Forbes blog, and it got over 60,000 views, 50 times normal. So clearly the world liked this. So I asked him, and he said, um, I'm an introvert, went on for 10 minutes in a quiet way. And he gave the example that as COO... The board said, Claude, you got to be a bit more extroverted, a bit more outgoing. And they gave him a coach who had a clicker like a, a bouncer does in a bar. And um, he gave the clicker to Claude and said, five times a day, Claude, you got to act like an extrovert to train yourself to be the CEO. So an example is he gave, he'd get in the elevator in the morning and uh, normally look at his feet as a good introvert and you know, just think about what he's going to do when he gets to the office. But if you want to be CEO, you got to go get in the elevator, go, good morning, Ben. Kind of nice day out there. Something you're not going to argue with with CEO. I mean, if it's if it's really cold to say it's a cold day, you know, something no one in their right mind's going to argue with. He said, Ben, you killed it last week in your presentation on the board. I appreciate your hard work, your insights. What you did was very valuable. Gets off the elevator. Because most of us, if the CEO doesn't know our name, if he or she doesn't pay attention to us, we go, that's it, I'm sending my resume to CP. We're moving to Calgary. Which is an overreaction, but the role of the CEO and the senior leaders is to recognize people, give inspiring speeches on occasion and so on. So Claude learned to do that, to be effective. Now what I would argue is that a, so you act like an extrovert. Final thought here is that, um, You've got to act like an introvert as an extroverted leader. So David uh, Benstoon runs Aldo, son of Aldo, came to class last week. He's 6'7", 250 pounds. He's not a boy. He's giant. He's the CEO of Aldo. He's the son of Aldo. Uh, son of Aldo. So if he comes to a strategy meeting where you have a room with a bunch of people, uh, if he spills out his ideas right away, as a good extrovert would do, it, it stops all thought. Because everybody goes, that's why you're the boss. I love it, David. Where what he wants to know, he already goes into the room knowing what he knows in his head already. What he wants to know, Ben, is what do you think? What does Susan think? What does Joe think? So he goes around the room and everybody expresses opinions. He holds back. Now at the end, happy thought, I'm the CEO, I get to decide. But we see what has been in his mind has evolved through the conversation. And he's taken on board our thoughts, which makes a better strategy. But it's also better leadership to be quiet and listen. So what I'm saying is that regardless of hard wiring, we got to act like the other, but realize who you are and be authentic to yourself because you've got to do that to be effective and remain sane as a leader. Yeah, no, Carl, I really appreciate you differentiating, you know, the differences between the three of those personality types, you know, within leadership. Because I do also think too that even if that's not our natural how do i say like personality type we do need to adapt right to to have the strengths and the weaknesses filled you know as a leader so i love how you kind of brought in you know susan kane right because she writes on the introverted side and and how they could lead amazingly as a leader so anyways i love those stories that you shared something that i like am thinking of right now is for any extroverted ceo that is tuning into this podcast right now How could they thrive in effectively managing both introverts and extrovert personality types that we just spoken about? Well, something where what I want to know is people that work for me and people I work for. So if my boss is an introvert, I'll approach them differently. 
So for my introverted boss or people who work for me introverts, what I'll do is I'll say, we're having a meeting in two days about this topic. So I give them warning so they can think about it, so they can do their research. Um, I'm not going to spring it on the last minute because they want to think and put it together. They want to connect the dots. And this is great. This is my own self-interest. So I'll say, Ben, we have a meeting in two days. Here's what I'd like to talk about. And in the meeting, I'll look at you. And what I'm saying is, Ben, are you ready to speak? And I won't do it right at the beginning because you want to hear some of the things and kind of warm up to it. But if you nod a little bit, I'll go, Ben, what do you think? Then you'll have some great insights because you've done your research and you've thought about it. Now, an extrovert, you can call on me as I go into a meeting and say, can you say a few words about almost anything? And I'll make it up and it'll be humorous and we'll enjoy it and we'll get things going. But I think aloud. So if I have a, an employee, you know, I might go down and see them and say, hey, John, and have 10 ideas. I'll bounce off the wall with ideas. Eight are dumb. One is good. One is excellent. I'm not embarrassed by the eight dumb ideas. I need to have an audience to, to think. Where an introvert has dumb ideas, they just never say them aloud. They go, oh, that's dumb. And they don't put it out there. Where I think aloud. So if you have a boss who's an extrovert or an extrovert working for you, part of what you do is just let them do that. Let them come and bounce off the walls. And all your job is to go, hmm, interesting. And interesting is kind of a neutral word where, you know, could be interesting. Someone that smart has such stupid ideas. But all you do is, is be an audience. And if you're the boss, you might go, you know, there's some great ideas in there. Ben, why don't you do a bit of research and come back to me, email me the top one in a day or two when you had a chance to do some research. So I will manage introverts and extroverts who work for me or who I work with, realizing their personalities, and I will lean in and allow them to be themselves because they'll be more effective if I do that. I love that you brought, uh, you know, those clear examples like you had mentioned for an introvert, right? Preparing them, right? Preparing them for that meeting, giving the heads up, giving like maybe the content subject or kind of matter because they, they like to think ahead, right? Rather than as they're not as spontaneous, maybe, right? Compared to an extrovert. Yeah. Well, what they want to do is that they, they want to think it through before they speak. So they're not the kind of people that uh, skate on thin ice like an extrovert's app to do. They want to think it through and they want to reflect before they speak. And that's great because they'll have, they'll have better thoughts if they've had time to think it through. Where my strength in my better moments is creativity and connecting remote ideas and I'm just not embarrassed when it doesn't work out, but that can be a very creative process. So we allow each to play to their strengths and that makes them more effective. So understanding your boss as well as the people who work for you and who they are. Now, I gotta say one thing here is that if you have a hammer, everything's a nail bin. So uh, I was fixing the back fence behind your house. We have a small backyard and I was fixing the fence and I ran out of nails. So what I was doing was hammering in screws. So an elderly neighbor comes by and goes, Carl, that's wrong. Almost morally wrong. But his point was, he was a bit wound up, but his point was a fair one, that a screw is a better fastening device than a nail if you screw it in. But if you hammer it in, it's less effective. So as a good worker, you need to have a bunch of tools. So when I think about human beings, Ben, you are introverted or extroverted, but you're also... I think a man, I mean, you see, you have a beard and hair, so I would, you know, that's probably maybe jumping to the conclusion, but, you know, if you ask your parents or a partner, they go, oh, Ben is much more complex than that. He has many things. So we need to know the wonderful complexity of human beings. One interesting dimension is introversion, ambiversion, and extroversion, but don't wear that, that set of lens too long. Put on other lenses. But in my experience, it's a helpful one and I'm writing a book on it, so I'm spending a stunning amount of time. But let's realize that people are many things. This is just one, albeit an important one. I love that. And I'm happy that you mentioned that because sometimes I reflect a lot, whether I'm an extrovert, introvert, or what I think I am. I think I'm an ambivert because I love getting that time with people, right? And, and you know, being very quick with decisions. But then I also love time in... I'll say kind of time and space where I'm alone with my thoughts, 
and I'm writing for hours or I'm, you know, on a run alone for hours where I'm alone. So I flip both sides of that coin. So I love that you're doing that research, you know, on kind of hitting all those areas. I love that. Question that I have in mind, how can the everyday CEO have success at blending a team of introverts and extroverts for the best business results? Because we talked about the differences, but how could they really connect these together? Well, something where they have to understand the strengths and weaknesses of each as well as get to know as individuals. So it's kind of, you know, one thing that, hey, this guy's more extrovert, this one's more introverted, this woman's more that way. But go deeper than that, as we talked about, get a, a sense of who they are as a full human being, and then just let them be themselves. On the other hand, I also want to develop my people where I would want someone who's more extroverted to learn to be introverted on occasion. So one is I want to lean into their normal, their strengths and take advantage of that. On the other hand, I want them to grow and become a bit more flexible, but I don't want them to be too flexible or they'll be inauthentic and it will be too demanding of themselves. It'll take too much energy from them. So I think it's a matter of understanding what are the relative strengths of the introvert, ambivert, and extrovert and understanding who your people are but allow them to go a little bit as well. Awesome. Great. Yeah. Carl, something that I want to kind of move to is, you know, we talking about, you know, the personality traits here within an organization and like leadership capabilities as kind of CEOs. How can a CEO today deepen their relationships and work better with millennials and Generation Z? Just finishing a book, I'm literally uh, sending it to a publisher this week where it's the final, final, you know, it's going to press. Uh, if you got anything wrong, it's on your head now sort of thing. Like, you know, make sure that you're uh, happy with it. And it's called Generation Y. And it's reflecting on how boomers can work with younger millennials and Zs. Now, it's interesting. I'm Canadian, so I would normally say Z, But I, I, Zs just sounds cooler and more with it. I don't know why. It's just one of those rare occasions I go with the American pronunciation. So Z's, what I'm arguing in the book in a sentence is this. People over 45 with university degree were taught a modern worldview. People under 35 with university degree were taught a postmodern worldview. And I explain what those two things are and say there's five things you got to manage postmoderns differently because of their worldview and how we taught them. So when I teach this executives, you know, I say to them, Mia culpa, I screwed up your workforce. Uh, because at universities, you learn, and at CEGEP in Quebec and junior colleges in the States and all, you learn the postmodern worldview, and therefore, it's quite different when the boomers and the Xers grew up with. Now, it's their world, so a boomer like myself can be postmodern or thinking, but there's a certain amount of, you know, kind of in the back of our mind going, wait a minute, I'm the boss, what don't you understand? Where that's too hierarchical for Zs and younger millennials. So it's kind of a, a view of the world which is rooted in truth and the way the world actually is. So I, one of the key points I make is when I give talks to executives, I, I'm say I'm older than most of you, but my workforce is younger than yours unless you, you are a manager of McDonald's. Because I have 19-year-old, 20-year-olds working for me. And I love Zs. I mean, I travel with them. I teach them. They work for me. spend a lot of time with them. Our own kids are Zs. And their worldview is largely of today's world. Now, I, I interviewed a guy, uh, General Martin Dempsey, who was the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, taught with him at Duke, and then interviewed him in his office in the Pentagon when he was uh, working. He was the guy that when Obama went to war, he was the general standing beside him as the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. And one of the most interesting things uh, General Dempsey said is that generals fight the battles of their youth. And what he meant by that was that he went to West Point and was a lieutenant with a tank during the Cold War in the plains of Germany. He was taught about leadership and strategy by men and women that had been young men and women in their 20s when you learn a lot about leadership and strategy in Vietnam, where small men in, uh, you know, in pajamas jumped out of the forest, shot you, and then disappeared in the tunnels. During the Cold War, they had a different strategy, and he learned about strategy and leadership there. Then he became a general in Desert Storm, and the point he made was that what the people from Vietnam, his own experience in the Cold War, was not entirely but largely irrelevant for Desert Storm. So generals, the leaders, that is, must learn to put away the lessons, some of the lessons of the past, to live in a, effectively in today's world. Well, Zs 
and younger millennials don't remember any other world. Like, this is it. They can't remember the 80s or the 70s. They weren't around then, and so we can hardly blame them. Where they are just overwhelmingly of today's world, one of the things we must do as older people is that be reverse mentored. Probably 25-30% of the time, I'm reverse mentored by 19-20 year olds because they're more up to date on certain things. Now, the flip side of that is 75% of the time, I'm mentoring them. So it's more me mentoring them, but what the newish thought is, is that you need to be reverse mentored by young people a considerable amount of the time. So I have a couple older mentors, they're great guys. Um, I don't think it would occur to them to ask my advice. Mentoring is one way, and that's, you know, uh, the senior generation or the boomers mentoring younger people is kind of the way we grew up, where in today's world, it's a two-way street, and that's really relevant because the world is more changing today than it was 20 or 30 years ago. So it may have worked, it did work in the past, but it's a different world today, and we've got to take that on board. Absolutely. Yeah, no, I think it's super important to be keeping up, up to, to date, right, and continuing to always evolve, right? But I do have a question in terms of what about that mentorship relationship, you know, in terms of the younger generations that they don't have from the perspective of the wealth or the knowledge or the wisdom that maybe the boomers had, you know what I mean? So I guess my question is, what about the other way around, you know, in terms of like personal biases that they might be missing, you know, like the millennials or or Gen Z? There's a lot of wisdom, but some of it gets dated. There's, there's an idea in intelligence of liquid and crystallized intelligence. And I think we can apply that to wisdom as well, that there's a crystallized wisdom or intelligence where I've learned certain lessons and they are profound lessons that are just true and they're still true today. Show respect to all people. You know, speak to people of high regard and people are treated lower and lower regard, like my dad was a janitor. So speak to the janitor That's, and the CEO equally as good human beings. So there's some crystallized, but there's also liquid intelligence or liquid wisdom that's saying, um, what should I do with TikTok? So I may start a TikTok channel, Ben. I'm having a 19 year old. I taught her mother many years ago. She grew up Canadian parents, but in Mexico City. So she's Mexican, now going to the U of T, 19. So she's a different generation, a different gender and a different nationality. But I would let her tell me what I should do in TikTok because she understands a way I don't. So she has a liquid intelligence or wisdom about TikTok that I lack and no one's surprised by that. Everybody totally gets on board with that idea. So I'm going to let her lead the way because I have crystallized wisdom, but it's not as germane. Like, you know, I might go, I'm not going to make fun of people of color or women because that's something I've learned is wrong. So that's crystallized. But the liquid is how do you actually, how long should a TikTok be? These are things where she has a a knowledge of today's world that I lack because of who she is. So together, but but the liquid intelligence and liquid wisdom is more required today because the world's changing more. Therefore, my crystallized wisdom, some of it is aged and um, is no longer relevant. So when we think about those two types of wisdom, liquid is what I'm looking for more these days. I appreciate that explanation and it kind of just showcases, right? Like the the values on both ends, but especially kind of like you said, with how things are evolving so much right now, there's things that are younger generation that could teach. They've actually mastered it quicker because it's part of their generation, right? So Carl, something that I want to go to is, you know, I think it's pretty cool that you've hosted over the years, a CEO series. You know, you've had the great honor to introduce some incredible humans. Some of those names include Pierre Beauvoir, former CEO of the Montreal Canadiens, Daniel Lamar, former CEO of the Cirque du Soleil, Mark Shapiro, the CEO of the Toronto Blue Jays. I'm a big fan of like the Olympics. In 2010, I carried the Olympic torch. What was it like to sit down with Dick Pound? And are there any memorable highlights that you'd like to share with our listeners? I'll tell you a story how I got to to know Dick. So when I started at um, McGill 22 years ago, the first week I'm here, I go, I'm invited to a lunch event. I sit at a, a round table of eight, seven or eight people. One is Dick Pound, so I'm sitting beside Dick Pound. And there's four or five students and there's a senior prof. So there's a lull in the conversation. And I say, I, I lean over Dick, I say, Dick, so do you have anything to do with McGill University? And 
the older prof goes in a, what we call a stage whisper, he's the chancellor. So everybody roars with laughter. And I said, hey, it's my first week. Give me a break. So whenever I saw Dick, I would say, oh, Mr. Chancellor, so good to see you. And he would laugh. So it's something where I just got to know him through a, a faux pas. You know, and I, it wasn't too faulty, but a, a faux pas. And I just phoned him up one day and said, uh, Dick, would you be one of my mentors? And he said, sure, be happy to. So I've been to his house a number of times. He lives a few blocks from us for a glass of scotch and chat with him and, and sometimes his wife and just, you know, talk about things on my mind to get his wisdom. So it's something where I've got to know him fairly well. And I've seen many, many McGill events, particularly when he was chancellor, and talked to him about the Olympics. So I've had some Olympic uh, students that I've taught. So Jennifer Hale, the skier, was a student of mine. And uh, Jennifer, when she was 19, had coffee with me in the Cafe Castell right near here by uh, the Brothman Building. And she said, Carl, we had some um, mutual friends in Spruce Grove, Alberta. She said, should I do my BCom or should I go to the Olympics? I said, Jen, we have thousands of BComs, few gold medalists go to the Olympics. And so she did want to win gold medals and silver medals and came back about six, seven years later and did her BCom. And she traveled, my students and I, that year we went to South Africa. So I got to know Jen well, and uh, I was teaching at Stanford on the MBA uh, earlier this year, and she's doing a master's at, at Stanford, so I had lunch with her. So it's great to get caught up, and I've had other, I've interviewed a dozen Olympians that I've taught, or like um, uh, Ken Dryden with, that uh, you know, I co-taught with, and it's, it's just fantastic to reflect on Dick's experience as the longest serving Olympian when he stepped down. Something like 60 years from when he competed in the Olympics to being on the committee and just incredible stories. And he was the guy who told the world they were not going to have the Olympics in Tokyo one year because of COVID and move it on. And he was just such authority and so believed by the media that the Japanese wanted Dick to do it. So it's something where you have an incredibly wise man who really understands the Olympic spirit and the nobility of it, where the most watched event, I, I had a guy, uh, Dr. Um, Laurent Tardif uh, Duvenet, who would come to class, who won a Super Bowl. And the most watched event in the world after, I think it, it surpassed the Super Bowl is the opening um, of the Summer Olympics. Because the whole world can go to the Summer Olympics. Winter, you know, you got to have snow uh, to do well, typically. And it's just one of the great events of the world where it's humanity at its best. That we are competing but respecting one another. And we cheer the person who helps another person and gives them a, a ski. Or picks up someone who fell. That we just see it's humanity in our better moments. So it's an inspiring thing to be with that you and I get to watch. And you know, I talked to a few Olympians where Dick was incredibly involved for decades. So one of Canada's, one of the world's great people, for sure. Thanks for sharing that story. It was cool to not just hear the story, but also feel like your excitement and your passion of those times there with Dick. And also to hear about, you know, some of those incredible athletes that you have. But most importantly, hearing about that opinion of kind of what you think he had an impact, you know, on the Olympic Games and and those values of community and, you know, empowerment and inclusion, right? So that's awesome. I, I really, really enjoyed that. Something that I want to move to, Carl, is I know last year, one of your highlights in 2021 was having Charles Bronfman come to your CEO Insights class at McGill University. What was one lesson you learned from Charles' experience in investing and uh, as well as business? You know, it's, it's fun because uh, his son, Stephen, comes to class, our CEO class every year. And uh, during the pandemic, I, uh, I said to McGill, you know, let me have class in person as a lot of them are donors. Let me schmooze them. And so they gave us a huge classroom of 250 and they allowed us to have 37. So Stephen emails me the day before he's come and said, can I um, bring Claudine, his wife and three of the four kids? And one had ballet, so couldn't come. And I think they were just bored of being at home during the pandemic. So dad was invited out. So let's go. And it was wonderful because at a certain point, he talked about how his grandfather, then his father, Charles, had created this business for him. And he looked at his kids and spoke to them about how when they're going to take the business over. And the next year, Charles came with his wife and then um, uh, Stephen and his wife, Claudine, and then uh, uh, Stephen's sister and her husband from L.A. So it was interesting because a couple of things struck me is that I said uh, 
we had Charles up first. And uh, he had mentioned, you know, he's 90. And I said, uh, Charles, now that you're 90, when did you slow down and retire? And his wife goes, he hasn't. So she shouts in the audience and he goes, I haven't. And it's something where what I liked about Charles is the long view. When you're 90 and, you know, you know, I'm in the Brothman building. He comes from a well-off family and he's been involved in investing since he was a little boy at the dinner table talking, his mom and dad talking. And he has an incredible network. So someone like that has a long view of history of, yeah, there's ups and downs. I've seen it many times. And he also builds in-depth relationships of people that he can call on for their wisdom and for what's happening in the industry. What's going on with TikTok anyway? Like, what's this guy doing at, at um, Twitter? And, and I think it's something where it's one of the great things you build. And I gave a talk to my students last week about the three things you get from a degree. One of them is a network. So, and I said, look, at there'll be a few people that you'll invite to your wedding, that they're close friends. There's other people that you're not as going to be as close a friend, but these days you keep in touch because you never know about that person from Ghana. You may end up in Ghana, which I am. And so one of my students is the crown prince of the Ashanti tribe. I taught him about 10 years ago. I've kept in touch because I like him. You go, that's really useful now. That when we go to Ghana, we may have the crown prince with us. So it's something where being friendly to many people and realizing the value of having a big, ne big network, and you don't know at 20 what you're going to do. But I, in my experience from talking to a lot of alumni that are you know, 30, 40, and 50, it's amazing how the network of McGill or business partners and so on can be very valuable throughout life and can be a source of, you know, friendship light as well as learning. So that's one of the big lessons I got from listening to Charles now a couple of times. That's awesome. Yeah, no, thanks for sharing that. I really enjoyed hearing about it. And I could also picture too, like the Brofman building, right? Like I could picture exactly where it happened. You have research, as we kind of discussed earlier, you know, CEO leadership for more than, you know, 20 years, you know, that's a long time. And you have interviewed, you know, thousands of other, you know, amazing CEOs. What do you believe separates, you know, a good CEO from a great CEO? Yeah, it's interesting. There's a few advantages to being older, Ben. One is you've done something longer than almost anyone else. So there's um, Adam Bryant, who uh, is from Montreal as well, but did the New York uh, Times corner office column for about eight years. So he's been interviewing many, many. So we kind of had a family, uh, friendly debate of who had interviewed more. And we came to a conclusion we weren't sure. But it was all good. And so one of the interesting things is that it's evolved over the last 25, 30 years of interviewing CEOs that it's much less hierarchical today, much less command and control, much less assurance that you know what you're doing. And it's a greater humility, not just for the sake of being humble, but it's just true that, you know, it's just true that younger people will know some things you don't know. So listen to them in a way you didn't in the past. So I think there's been an evolution of what a great CEO is. A couple things they are is they're humble they're authentic. And part of it is saying, you are who you are. So it's going back to that study at Harvard of looking at four-month-old four babies and falling for decades, is that to some degree, your DNA, you're an introvert or extrovert based somewhat on your DNA. Therefore, be true to yourself. Like, accept yourself for the person you are. Now, put away your faults and silliness and don't get carried away. But I think it's saying being true to yourself and so that if you talk to a CEO's family, they'd go, no, that's mom. You know, she's the same way at home with us as she is at work in the sense that she is this kind of person and comes across. So I think that these days, Zs and millennials want authenticity, but the world wants authenticity. What you see is what you get is truly the person. Now, you know, we get rid of the rough edges and we grow up and we learn certain things and learn, you know, as a society evolves, we evolve with it. But I think it's evolved to where now humility, a willingness to listen. But at the same time, at a certain point, listening and, and that, you, you, there's a point to be a leader and make a decision. I've listened to this, different viewpoints, Here's what we're going to do going forward. 
Now, even when you do that, I, I wrote a piece for the Golden Mail. It was the most uh, read piece online, the second most read uh, piece online a couple years ago. It was entitled, um, Never Apologize, Never Explain. Bad ideas with millennials. When I was younger, there were some people that say, never apologize, never explain. Where I go, what you should do, I explain most of my decisions, almost all of them to people, students who work for me. Because I want them to go, that's interesting, had you thought about this. But then my thinking will evolve as I explain things. Because maybe I've got it wrong, it's a little bit dated. So I explain things and I'm ready to apologize if I've offended someone. I, I tend to be fairly woke. Um... And woke at its better moment, Ben, is just being respectful of people we didn't respect in the past. And I ask undergraduates, I say, let me know when I'm not woke. But some of our older guests come and say things that are dated, just expressions that people don't... I had Paul Martin class, so and Brian Mulrooney, and they just said things that I understood as a boomer. I'm not sure the, Z, the Zs understood just what the expression meant. It was nothing wrong, just a different expression. But there's also things that we shouldn't say anymore... So I try to be woke, which brings me up to date and keeps me there. So the world moves on. We've got to go with it, but be authentic and true to ourselves. So you got to kind of sort your way through the, the tension of those two ideas. But I see a lot of people doing it well. Thanks for sharing all those qualities. I definitely agree with, you know, authenticity and, and being genuine and being true to yourself. And I think you nailed it too in terms of being a good listener because we do have two ears, one mouth, right? Common expression, which uh, I don't think that expression will ever go out of date, but it's so true. And something that I, I kind of want to shift to is, you know, you did talk about decisions, right? And I know you are familiar with the term mental models. In case my listeners do not know what that is, a mental model is a set of assumptions, beliefs, values, and perceptions which we carry. What is one mental model that could help CEOs become great leaders and make more intelligent decisions? It's interesting because I'm, I'm writing a book with a guy at uh, Duke University that I've taught with for years, and it's a sporting analogy. It's saying when you go from the AHL to the NHL or from college ball to the NBA, the game speeds up. And, and you know, we've talked a bunch like Ken Dryden and the famous athletes in Greek, that the, it, it's a different world. And in the same way, you go from being, you know, a superstar to a manager, from a manager, manager, managers to C-suite to CEO, the game speeds up and it's a different game. So in some ways, CEOs have got to learn what is it that a CEO does. And I've had a few CEOs come to class that I've known for years. Uh, the guy, Mirko, who runs Bell, uh, the new CEO, Laurent, of um, National Bank. And they're both COOs. So they came to class and I said... Is it different being a CEO? And they said, Carl, it's so different. And I said to both of them, I know them fairly, I said, like for a year or two, you followed the CEO around, not quite like a puppy dog, but you know, and they laughed. And But how can you be surprised? And they said, well, it's different when you're in the corner office and there's no one that's above you. I mean, there's a chair of the board, but there's politics sometimes. And to a certain degree, it's lonely at the top is part of what it is. And what you need to do is make it less lonely by getting counselors, getting advisors that can help you understand some of the things that you're responsible as CEO, that the buck stops here is a famous old expression. And I think coming to terms with that idea that I'm responsible, I've got to do it, I can get advice, but ultimately I've got to make a decision and accept the consequences is something I think that um, is a mental model that CEOs got to take on board. Thanks for sharing. And Carl, as you know, the purpose of this podcast, you know, is to inspire millions of people to achieve greatness and enhance their overall personal well-being. What is your definition of greatness? I think the definition would be around serving and making the world a better place. Um, and it can be, I have the head of the Red Cross Canada. I've interviewed the worldwide head of the Red Cross as well. Uh, Dr. Joan Liu, who is a president of uh, Médecins Sans Frontières, Doctors Without Borders, uh, have her come to class as well. And what it, it may be you know, more obvious in that context, but in the context of business as well, it's making the world a better place. It may be through your products, your services, but being a servant leader is probably what I would suggest we should all go for. And that connects with the idea of purpose, which is a big thing right now in the literature, is that you need to have some purpose beyond making money. I showed my students a bumper sticker 
for boomers and it was he who dies with the most toys wins and they're horrified genuinely horrified by the shallowness of the boomers but i remember we you know i don't know why but we we're we measured ourselves by the kind of car we drove by the kind of suit we had where we lived and today we want to have some purpose that is beyond merely ourselves but serving and doing some better for humanity in a world which is troubled, in a world which is uncertain because of climate change and racism and various things that we run into our world. So I think however you do it, making the world a better place, which would include your own family if you have a family, caring for them and serving them. So I think that's the thing that comes to my mind after talking to a thousand CEOs and so on. That's a beautiful definition, Carl. I appreciate you for sharing, you know, active service and kind of giving back and, and kind of making like the world a better place, right? Being more purposeful and providing more meaningful experiences, right? So who is a future guest that you would like to see on this show interviewed? Henry Mintzberg, one of the great management thinkers of the world. Uh, that's why at McGill, you know, he and Michael Porter are the two biggest names in strategy and business. So I, if you can, get, I, you know, I'd be happy to connect. I think Henry would be someone you should absolutely have in your show. Very much up to date, very much of today's world, but with enormous crystallized wisdom. Well, I'll, uh, I'll add him to the list there and I would be happy to have him on. So if you decide, you know, to connect those dots, that'd be awesome. And Carl, where is the best place for my listeners to connect with you online? Uh, carlmoore.org or send me an email, carl.moore at mcgill.ca, carl with a K, M-O-O-R-E and mcgill.ca rather than com. So both those ways work well. I will be sure, you know, to put that in the podcast notes. And I want to take this last moment to really thank you for being here today. You've been very generous with your time. And I know it's been a very busy time right now with, you know, the final weeks of your courses, as well as your book that you're working on. So I want to take this last little moment to just thank you for being here today. Thanks, Ben. Uh, great questions. I'll steal a couple from my uh, radio show. Thank you for listening to the Living Your Greatness podcast. If this show has added some value, don't be shy to subscribe, leave a rating, and make a review.